Bless us in Sunday school. Give us a heart to hear your word, God. Teach us and instruct us to be a soul winner, God. Give us anointing and blessing and dominion in Jesus' name. Amen. We're looking at our fifth lesson of the Master's plan of evangelism. I pray that God's helping you and you're putting this into your, uh, your quiver, so to speak, each one of these lessons and going out and uh, putting it into practice and in the evangelism that you are involved in. Uh, we're looking at a Mark chapter 10 today. And this lesson is on spiritual opposition. The last two weeks, uh, Jesus was witnessing to a stranger, gives us the blueprint of how to witness. We bring people to a decision about their sin. They understand they're repenting of their sin and getting it right with God, saying a prayer. Uh, to be born again, that will go a long ways in allowing us to have opportunity to follow up, get information from them. Last week we spoke about strategic ways, places of fruitfulness like family, friends, workplaces, neighborhoods. And today we want to look at uh, the opposition that comes spiritually through the demonic and several scriptures that will bring this out. I, I chose uh, Mark 10, verse 1 and 2. Now, uh, don't get diverted in the uh, nuance of what the, what the Pharisees ask the question for, because you'll spend the rest of the Sunday school trying to figure out, you know, about divorce. But they, they ask him about divorce, but it's actually a demonic assault against what he's doing. Let's read that, Mark 10, verse 1 and 2. Then Jesus arose from there and came to the region of Judea. By the other side of the Jordan, and multitudes gathered to him again. Now notice, multitudes. And as he was accustomed, he taught them again. So all these people come. He's witnessing. He's preaching. He's teaching. He's healing. He's doing his uh, work of the ministry. Verse 2. Then the Pharisees came and asked him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Testing Jesus. Now he goes on to explain some things. We're not going to... Uh, look at that. What we want to talk about is the spiritual opposition because this is a classic example of how the enemy works. Let's look at the arena, first of all. There is spiritual opposition to soul winning, and we must be awakened to this reality. There is much going on in our effort to evangelize, and that is the hidden realm. The devil and the demonic actively oppose all efforts for evangelism. The basis of what we're going to look at is how the enemy is always opposing the work of evangelism. I'd like to give out a few scriptures as we begin this morning. Uh, we'll start here. Uh, Isaac, if you look up Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. Cody, Acts 16, verse 16 through 18. Titus, Mark 5, verse 2. J, Acts 13, 6 through 11. Sarah, Matthew 28, verse 18 and 19. Thad, Mark 16, 15 through 18. Debbie, Matthew 17, verse 20 and 21. Jezreel, Acts 19, verse 13 through 16. Russ, Isaiah 54, 17. Alina, Romans 8, 37. Veronica, 2 Corinthians 10, 4, and 5. And that's our scripture for today. So this 
arena of spiritual opposition. I have to understand, we're talking about the demonic element that is always opposing soul winning. Evangelism is going to be assaulted in this realm continually. So we begin looking at some scriptures then. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12 gives us a baseline understanding of the spiritual realm. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. So Paul says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. That means, you know, people, people to people. But against principalities. So the wrestling then is in the spiritual hosts of wickedness. But it still manifests through flesh and blood. We may not wrestle against flesh and blood, but the spiritual can manifest through flesh and blood. The Bible reveals that people are often the vehicle of opposition. Now, that may challenge your theology, but this is what the Bible reveals. We find three main areas where the spiritual will manifest through people, and one is the religious spirit. This is what is happening in our main scripture. Jesus is ministering. Multitudes are there. He's doing what he always does. He's teaching, preaching, healing, working miracles. He's ministering. The Pharisees, who are religious people, they come up and they interrupt him to argue. Now think of this moment as Jesus is teaching And expounding truth, no doubt people are getting touched. Revelation is being given. People are coming to faith in him. These Pharisees come up and ask a question about divorce and the law. Now, there's a demonic element to that question. There's a demonic element to the fact that they would interrupt him, demand his attention, and ask a question way out here on the peripheral when he's ministering to sinners. Now this happens repeatedly on outreach. This happens at the doorstep. This happens in the streets. This happens when you're following up. How many times have you thought, just when I was getting ready to pray with them, somebody came up and interrupted. Their phone rang. Something happened. Just when the altar call was going to happen, People get up and walk out the door. Their phone rings and they run outside to answer the phone. That's a spiritual issue. You have to understand the spiritual. These Pharisees are wanting more than just to argue with him. The devil is stirring them. He's animating them. He's agitating them. He's agitating a religious spirit that wants to argue about things that have nothing to do with evangelism. Nothing to do with these people being saved. They're they're sinners. They're they're there. The multitude has come because they need to be healed. They need to be set free. They need to be uh, uh, delivered. They need miracles. Uh, And these Pharisees come up in their pompous attitude. uh, Everything in their life's okay as far as they're concerned. What do you think about the divorce, Jesus? Wait, what? What are you talking about? That has nothing to do with what I'm ministering to these people about. But the devil is agitating the religious spirit. And his goal is to hinder the work of evangelism, to hinder what God is doing. How often, when you're witnessing to somebody, some religious person comes up and wants to argue. When you're street preaching, It's always a religious person or a crazy person that wants to come up and argue. This is not how you're supposed to do that. What do you think about the Trinity? What do you think about revelations? You know, just off the wall stuff has nothing to do with what we're focused on evangelism. And yet, it's a spiritual issue. The second thing, the second way that the demonic opposes to spiritual things is demonic vexation. 
We read in the book of Acts about a girl, a little girl who had a spirit of divination, and this is a strategy to assault the work of the gospel. Acts chapter 16, verse 16 through 18. Now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with the spirit of divination met us, who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And this she did for many days. But Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. This is not a coincidence. This girl is not attracted to them because she wants to be saved. She's not following them because she's a convert and she's testifying about what Jesus has done in her life and how these are men of God and you need to hear them and uh, they, they proclaim the way of salvation. I'm saved today because of this. This is not what's happening. She did this for many days. This is the demonic that is attracted to the proclamation of the gospel. Let's read Mark 5, verse 2. And when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. Jesus gets out of the boat, and immediately the uh, contemporary English version says, a man with an evil spirit quickly ran to him. Now, Jesus is ministering. He's doing the work of uh, evangelism. And this man possessed with an evil spirit immediately runs to Jesus. Why? Because the demonic is attracted to the proclamation of the gospel. This, was a dem this is what happens when we step out into the arena of evangelism. The demonic is attracted to it. It draws the demonic. It draws those that have demons, those that are demonically inspired. They're drawn to the outreach. They're drawn to the street meeting. They're drawn to the, the concert in the park or whatever's going on. I can't tell you how many times in Eugene, which is, you know, demonic capital of the Northwest, as far as I'm concerned, <laughs> we would be doing an outreach and some demonic person would come running, running to, to, to be right in the center of everything that's going on, whether we were street preaching uh, or we were doing a, a graffiti contest, uh, and these demon-inspired people would come, and they would try to draw attention to themselves. Whether that was screaming or dancing uh, or stripping their clothes off and, and trying to get attention. It's demonic. One time in particular, we were having our graffiti outreach, uh, and uh, this woman ran up, and we had a concert going, and the guys are doing their graffiti, and lots of visitors there. God's moving. This woman comes up, and she starts to belly dance. I mean, she literally takes her clothes off and is dancing in the middle of our park outreach. Nothing on from the waist up. Got all these men there, disciples in the church, visitors. It's like, welcome to Eugene, guys. We had a team from out of town. They're like, what in the world's happening? What's going on? It's like, this is normal. This doesn't happen where you're from. <laughs> we quickly ushered her out of there, called the police. Another time, uh, we were having the same park. We learned not to go to this park anymore, but we're, same park. We're having a similar outreach. We had the guys from Vancouver there. I mean, the thing's cranking. Vince is rapping. There's all kinds of, there's hundreds, it seemed like hundreds of people. I can't remember, probably not that many, but uh, it was happening. It was our graffiti outreach, uh, and uh, I think it was either the graffiti or the, or the BMX. I don't remember which one. It was so years ago. And uh, God is uh, moving, and all of a sudden, this truck pulls up, this semi-truck, Stops. Uh, the door goes open, and there's this band there, full band. They have massive speakers. They turn it up to ten and just started cranking this demonic music. I mean, <laughs> you know, guar, man. It's like total demons. <laughs> and we couldn't hear ourselves think. It was so loud. We couldn't, you know, Jed's trying to do the announcing of what's going on, and we, and uh, nobody can hear a thing because this music is absolute. And, and so I made a made a beeline for those guys as fast as I could run, pull out my phone, I, and I yelled as loud as they couldn't hear me, but I, they read my lips, I'm calling the police on you, and uh, they, 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 they stopped, and I said, get out of here, we're calling the police on you, you are breaking the law, we have a permit for this, you don't, and they packed up and took off. That's demonic. That is absolutely demonic. 
We are witnessing, we are preaching, and the demonic is attracted to the proclamation of the gospel. Jesus got us out of the boat, and the Gadarene demonic runs to him to try to distract and afflict and assault. Here is this girl with the spirit of divination. She's known all over town. People go to her to get their fortune told, to get uh, all kinds of, uh, you know, uh, 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 satanic advice. Well, you know, that was pretty common back in those days. She tells the future. She's a soothsayer. She reads palms, whatever she does. She's known all over this, this area. And she's walking along with Paul and the others. And she's yelling out and proclaiming, these are men of God. Listen to them. They tell us the way of salvation. And the Bible says that Paul is greatly annoyed. And after many days, he turns and rebukes the demon and says, Come out of her, you foul demon. Why? This girl was sent to mock them, to distract, to hinder. The devil is seeking to discredit the disciples. Because, you know, the law, the Jewish law, they were to abhor witchcraft. They were to hate sorcery and witchcraft and all demonic things. And here they are trying to proclaim the gospel. And here's someone who's attaching themselves to their outreaching and trying to get people to identify that she's with them. You know what that does? Because everyone knows her and who she is and what she is. Her being with them... People are going to automatically assume the disciples and her are on the same page. And she's going to bring discredit to them that she's somehow with them. And they're going to link them with her. That means they're going to link them with the demonic. Now this, because they're with this girl's with them, she's demonically possessed. She's not, she's not giving her testimony because she's delivered of demons. She's manifesting demons. And now people are going to think, you know what, the, the disciples, they link with crazy people. Why should we listen to them? They're crazy people. The church, the Christian, they're lunatics. They're crazy people. They're demon-possessed. And that's a mockery. That is, that is a, a discrediting. The devil tries to discredit the true gospel by linking them with a demonic element that everything they do is by demonic power. That's a mocking spirit. The devil wants to attach and identify and make people think that the church, the outreach, and everything is discredited because of these demonic manifestations. No doubt you've run into this in the streets. When you're out street preaching, and somebody comes up and begins to declare, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Lord, and they're demon-possessed. And people are going to walk right on by thinking they're with you and walk away thinking those people are crazy. They target the worker. Paul felt it. He felt grieved. He was annoyed. He felt this demonic spirit. He recognized it. Listen, crazy people are attracted to the gospel proclamation. And people want to link them with us. That means they need to leave. Because if the devil can bring crazy people into the outreach, into the street meeting, into the labor, then we're going to look like we're crazy. The third thing is demonic distractions. The classic illustration of Sergius Paulus, the governor, about ready to get saved, and this sorcerer steps in between. Let's read that, Acts 13, verse 6 through 11. Now, when they had gone through the island to Patmos, or to, pa yeah, Patmos, they found that to, uh, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar Jesus, who was with the proconsul Sergius Peleus, an intelligent man. This man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elimaeus, the sorcerer, or so his name is translated, withstood them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. Then Paul, who is also called, or Saul, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, 
O oh, full of all deceit and fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? And now indeed the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. And immediately a dark mist fell on him, and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Okay, so here is this demonic distraction as the disciples are witnessing to this man. Think of this. This is a high-level person that is being influenced by the witness of Paul and the apostles. And as he's very close to getting saved, this Elimus begins to whisper in his ear, don't listen. This is, this is a demon-inspired man. His name was Bar-Jesus. <laughs> There's lots of Bar-Jesuses out there, isn't there? Oh, I'm a Christian. Bar Jesus, B A R means son of, son of Jesus. This man, well, I, I believe in Jesus. I'm a Christian. But I, but I don't believe what these people are believing. Oh, they're, they're, they're telling you uh, this and this, but, but my Jesus isn't like that. My Jesus is, is like this. That's what he's essentially doing. He's, he's trying to persuade the proconsul to not really repent and be converted and listen to Paul and follow. Jesus by saying, well, I know about Jesus. But really, he's a sorcerer. He's demon-filled. He's sent by the enemy to interrupt the witness, to stop the witness, to turn away the pro counsel from the Lord. So why does God show us things in the Bible? It's so that we will do what they did in the Bible in those situations. The answer is found in the scripture's account. A spiritual issue has a spiritual solution. Let's talk then about dealing with spiritual opposition. This is what the Bible reveals we are to do. Evangelism must coincide with spiritual dominion. And that dominion is established in faith. We have the power and the authority through Jesus Christ. Let's read a couple of scriptures. Uh, Matthew 28, verse 18 and 19. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. So this is the Great Commission. Go ye. And all power, all authority, you go make disciples. You go to the nations. Mark 16, 15 through 18. And he said unto them, Go ye unto all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, and he that believeth not shall be damned. And these things shall follow them that believe in my name. Shall they cast out devils? They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink a deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Okay, so in the great commission of Jesus is the element of power over the demonic. Not only did he say go, preach, make disciples, he said, you need to go, and in that going, cast out demons, have authority over it, nothing will hurt you. He's talking about serpents and, and scorpions. Those are, those are demonic things, demonic elements. And you will be filled with authority and dominion and power, and you're to exercise that dominion over the supernatural. Because here's the issue. When, he, when Jesus said go, he's saying there's going to be opposition. You're going to need to exercise dominion and authority over spiritual opposition. We are to exercise this authority in evangelism and for evangelism. The first way we do that is in prayer. Many battles of dominion are first won in prayer. This is why we pray before we outreach. Because the battle is often won in establishing of dominion. You don't want to go 
evangelize without having dominion. So you need to establish dominion by faith and by prayer. Prayer is establishing things. It's not a wish list for Santa Claus. It is establishing things through power and dominion and faith. And the dominion in evangelism is a result of the exercise of our faith. It's something that needs to be in us. You don't just take an empty vessel and try to fill it and then go use it. God's call is that we are filled always. That we remain in a state of filled with faith and dominion. We find this as the disciples are unable to cast out a demon. And let's read what Jesus told them. Why? Matthew 17, 20 and 21. Jesus said to them, Because of your unbelief, for assuredly I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. However, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. So they're unable to cast out a demon. They're trying to exercise authority and dominion in outreach. And they're not able to. Jesus comes, casts it out. They want to know, why could we not do that? Your unbelief. Why did they have unbelief? Because they were not praying and fasting. Very simple. These men had been giving themselves to a spiritual life and relationship with Jesus uh, Fasting and praying and establishing dominion on a daily basis, Jesus says you would have a lot more success over the demonic. See, when you understand what is happening and that this is happening and that it's spiritual, you'll be driven to establish dominion daily. The only time you pray Saturday morning before outreach, and that's the only time you pray about outreach, good luck on really establishing dominion. If you haven't prayed Monday through Friday and then you go on Friday outreach and expect to have dominion in the streets, you don't get it. You, there's a reason why the devil would exercise authority over you and interrupt your witnessing and interrupt your follow-up and interrupt your, your evangelism and your street meeting. This is not coincidence. But when you understand the spiritual opposition, You'll be driven to establishing dominion. If you want success in evangelism or follow-up, prayer is going to give you dominion. A weak Christian is weak spiritually, and that affects dominion. So that's number one. That's, that's how you have authority and dominion is through your relationship with Jesus and through your prayer life. You have to be exercising dominion in prayer. Prayer is preemptive. You're praying against the demonic assault in evangelism. When you see what happens in the Bible, it ought to shape your prayers. God, I bind demon-inspired people sent to interrupt this outreach. I take dominion over them. They're not going to come. God, you know they're planning to come. You divert them and send them somewhere else. Send them to Taco Bell. <laughs> send them to the duck game. Send them somewhere besides our outreach, right? Whatever. Send them to the beaver game. I don't care. Maybe it'll help them. Lord, send them to the Grateful Dead concert. Send them somewhere else. You know who's planning on coming. You know what the devil's planning on doing. God, I pray authority and dominion in this part. I pray this in the outreach tonight. I pray this in the streets. That's what you should be doing Monday through Friday. But if you don't pray, then you're probably not going to be doing that. And if your only prayer is five minutes before you go out onto the street, oh, Lord, please help us tonight. You might not be as effective as you should be. That's preemptive dominion. That's authority. That's understanding the Great Commission, understanding what the devil's trying to do. If you're going to go follow up on somebody, you need to be praying, God, do not let them change their plans. Close every door that would lead them away. Turn people away that would come and try to distract them from tonight and, or tomorrow when we plan to get, get together with them. It's preemptive. If it happens too many times, you need to wake up and say, this is demonic. It's demonic that if every time I'm going to get with this person, something happens, then I'm going to start praying against something happening. Every day, establishing dominion. If you pray for five minutes a day, good luck in really getting a hold of God about specific things. I don't understand people that can pray for 15 minutes and call it good. How do you do that and really cover the basis of just worshiping God in 15 minutes? 
let alone establishing dominion and praying for all the needs and everything and person in the church and need and new converts and the world and everything. How do you do that in 20 minutes? I don't understand that. On the way to work, how do you do that? You don't. Good answer. You don't do well and you don't have a lot of dominion. But if you take it seriously and you want to be fruitful, look, we're talking about being fruitful. If you don't really care about fruitfulness, then you won't put anything into practice that we're teaching. But I'm a fruitful man. And I bear a lot of fruit in the kingdom, and I'm trying to help you. And that's not pride, that's reality. That's what pastors do. They teach. Try to teach you how to be fruitful. How to be a soul winner. How to establish dominion so that when you make plans with somebody, the plans work. They happen. Now, again, that doesn't mean every single time everything works perfectly. As I said, we had these manifestations in our outreaches in Eugene, but I learned a lot of things. I learned this is not acceptable. I'm going to pray against these people. Where do you think I learned to pray against people coming and, and stopping our outreaches, by them stopping our outreaches and realizing this can't happen? This is not acceptable. I'm going to pray against the demonic long before this happens because I don't want that to happen. I don't want that to happen. He's tired of enough people getting up and walking out during your altar call, young man, that you start saying, I'm going to pray that people stay in their seat by the Holy Spirit when I pull altar calls. And they're going to lift their hand and answer the altar call. It's not acceptable they sit in their seat and do not respond when I preach. That's not going to happen. That's a demonic. So you have to begin to realize this is real and I need to do some things in my prayer life and my faith and what I believe in and establish some things so that when I'm at the doorstep and that person's about ready to get saved, their phone isn't going to ring because God's not going to let it. Or their demon-inspired husband isn't going to get his lazy rear off the couch and come over and tell, tell me to leave and shut the door in my face when I'm witnessing to his kids or his wife. Hello? Got to have dominion. And you'll pray against the demonic assault that's attracted to the gospel or that seeks to divert or the religious spirit that seeks to interrupt, God will help you. Your faith establishes things. So that's preemptive. So what happens in the moment then? Because in our text, in all three of these examples, Jesus and Paul and the, and the disciples take dominion in the present. Now, these are men of God. These are men who prayed up. Jesus is always prayed up, by the way. He would always go out to a mountain and pray while the disciples took naps. That's usually what happens. Pastors at church praying, disciples are taking naps. But that's a whole other issue. <laughs> what, could you not watch with me for an hour? No, Pastor, I'm tired. I get it. So am I. Pray. Anyways, let's, let's move on. Jesus prayed up. Paul's prayed up. They're going, they're going to morning prayer. Put that in your theology. This girl's mocking them, not only on their outreaches, but as they're going to morning prayer. So they're men of prayer. They're men of wisdom. They're men of the word. So they take dominion in the present. What does Jesus do? He's touching the multitudes, right? Jesus, teacher, master. These people are always flattering, but what about divorce? Well, Jesus shuts it down with a rebuke. He brings sound doctrine dismisses them and gets back to business. Now, it's important you understand what was happening. As all these people are there, the disciples are there, new converts are there, visitors are there, needy people are there, Jesus realizes wisdom. I need to handle this situation wisely. He shuts it down with a rebuke. He just brings out in like five sentences what the Bible says about divorce shuts them down with that, and then moves on. Now, that's called rebuke with doctrine. It's very wise on several layers. One is he doesn't want the multitude to scatter. So if he sits there for the next three hours and expounds with these men, the multitudes, multitudes will begin to disperse. That's not wise. Some people will spend an hour and a half at a doorstep when they should just move on argue with someone for 35 minutes in the streets when you just need to move on and witness the people. It's demonic diversion. He shuts it down very quickly. He answers their question, answers it to the point, moves on. 
He doesn't want the multitudes to disperse. He's also teaching his disciples. The disciples are there watching how Jesus responds to this demonic element. They know the Pharisees are agitated by Jesus. They know that the Pharisees are agitated by the demonic. And that Jesus is teaching them how to be effective and to carry out the will of God. You know, a lot of times on an outreach, there's going to be younger converts there. There's going to be new, new people there. Brothers and sisters that are weaker, you have to have wisdom. If you blow up into a drag out, knock down argument with somebody, you're going to affect people negatively that are new converts. They're going to think, I don't know if I want to come back to outreach. Right? New converts are very, very susceptible. They already doubt a lot of things. Or maybe they're a younger brother or sister or, or, or a weaker brother or sister, I should say. And so they're going to be watching what's unfolding. You've got to have wisdom. Jesus shuts it down with a biblical, sound, doctrinal rebuke and then moves back to what he was doing. That's wisdom. He's not going to argue with them, right? He's not going to sit there and argue aimless points on and on because he has an awareness of what's happening, a recognition, and a discernment. He speaks to it moves on. As Pastor Mitchell says, keep the main thing the main thing. It's a lot that's happening in a given situation. And it's important that you realize that if you use wisdom, you can do a lot of good even for other people that are there with you. We want our new converts to be on our outreaches. But we don't want them to think it's a good place to get into a fist fight. We have had that problem before with new converts getting into fist fights. Brother, that's not how you shut down the arguments. I understand the man's demon possessed, but you don't punch him out. <laughs> We're trying to reach the rest of these people too, you know. Now we have to run. <laughs> it's not what we came here to do. Now we have to run for our lives. <laughs> Been there, don't want to do that anymore. <laughs> I've had to run because the wrong thing happened on an outreach. Don't look at me like that. I had the, the entire downtown group of hoodlums chasing Troy and I down through the streets. It's just him and I on an outreach. He's a new convert. As a good disciple, I'm taking every one of my new converts on outreach. I took him on as one of his very first outreaches. We're witnessing. Something went down that shouldn't have went down. And I said something to those that did it. And I shouldn't have reacted that way. I didn't do anything violent. I just, I didn't cuss, thank God. But I said something in a confrontational manner. And you know what? When there's two of you and like 50 of them, <laughs> they said, we are kicking your, you know, fill in the blank. Yeah. And we ran for our lives. In this downtown Eugene, we are literally running. It's like a Tuesday afternoon, it's just him and I. And we're running down the alleyway. And there, it's like a movie, man. I'm looking behind me, and there's 50 rat, rat pack kids. Jed might have been one of them before he was saved. He always hung out down there. He might have been one of them. All these heroin, druggy little thugs, wannabes, and they're chasing us. And we're literally running for our lives. We ran like three blocks back to where our car was. Thank God there was a, a police officer that drove by. Right as we came around the last corner, and all the people stopped, and we made it to our car and got out of there. Well, that would have been a really bad call to pastor. Pastor, I'm in the hospital. Great outreach, by the way, but I'm in the hospital. Can you come get, uh, pray for me? What happened, brother? Oh, uh, somebody laid hands on us and pled the blood over our lip. And now we're in the hospital bleeding. No, so he got his wisdom. Because there's others there, Jesus shuts it down with sound doctrine, moves on. That's a dominion in the present. So what do the, what do the uh, uh, Paul and the apostles do? He rebukes the demon. Casts it out. He stands up to this sorcerer and says, you're not going to distract this witness. You'll be blinded for a season. Exercises authority over him. 
And the man is blinded, and the governor sees this, says, I need Jesus, get saved. They used dominion in the moment. Now, they could do that because they were men of dominion. Jesus and Paul were able to affect the moment because they were men of prayer, right? Spiritual life. Jesus said to the disciples, you could not cast out the demon because of unbelief. He linked it to their spiritual life, and he linked it to a lack of prayer and fasting. Let's read Acts 19, verse 13 through 16. An outreach gone bad. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this. But the But the evil spirit answered them, Jesus, I know, and Paul, I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered all of them, and overpowered them, so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. Okay. So it's not just naming names and saying words. You better have real authority. If you're just going through the motions and playing games, you are already defeated. But God has a promise for you in evangelism, and that is that you will have dominion. Authority is your portion. Fruitfulness is your calling. And if you want to be effective in soul winning, then you need to take this seriously. The devil must respond to a man or a woman of God who exercises their faith and their authority, authority against him. A few scriptures to bring that uh, clarity. Isaiah 54, 17. Sorry. Uh, no weapon formed against you shall prosper, and every tongue which rises against you in judgment you shall condemn. Um, this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is from me, says the Lord. Okay, it's our heritage. This is God's will for his people. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Romans 8.37. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Okay, we are the victorious. victorious. And lastly, 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5. The weapons that we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. And so we do have weapons. It's a spiritual war. It's not against flesh and blood, but it manifests through flesh and blood. But our weapons are mighty. Pulling down strongholds. Casting down arguments. High things that exalt themselves against God. That's the opposition that plays out against evangelism. Winning souls is more than having the right words to say. It's exercising power and witnessing with anointing. And these are purchased in a relationship with Jesus. You are a chosen vessel. You need to have faith and speak with authority. Speak with confidence that you have the answers and you are sent by Jesus and commissioned by Jesus to be a witness for him. Fruitfulness is not out of the realm of any man, woman, or child. If you have faith and believe what God said, you will be fruitful. And in that process, there is the need to establish dominion and at times, even in the moment, to use wisdom and dominion. And if you'll do that, God will, God will help you. I've seen this play out. I, I've learned a lot of things over the years and praying changes a lot of things that, that would go wrong. And I, I started to see a great difference in uh, freedom and favor and dominion in a lot of different areas as I prayed to begin to pray many of the prayers that I told you about today and there was a difference in the atmosphere of the outreaches and the witnessing uh, if you're sick and tired of people being diverted at the last minute then you need to start praying actively against that spirit that's a demonic thing if you accept it it'll exercise authority but if you take dominion over it and you speak against it and you bind the people. You don't have to know their name. Just bind the people that would come against what you're trying to do. If you're not finding people home on a Saturday, that's a prayer issue. It's a dominion issue. 
right? It is. Pray against those things that drive people out of their homes, that they would be there when you go knock on their door or when you go to follow up on them and watch uh, the, the atmosphere change because it is about dominion and God has given you the authority. He wants you to be fruitful. Amen. Praise God. We're going to stop there. You're ready for service today. God bless you.